Wow. Um, no pressure then. Morning, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. Thank you, Boris. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, here we are. Um, so I'm going to tell you the story of uh, Good Trouble. Uh, you know, as Steve mentioned, this is a two-year-old publication uh, looking at protest and activism uh, through the lens of, of arts and culture. Um, you know, I'm going to tell you how it came about, and you know, Steve gave you a little bit of an introduction to that. But before I get into that, I'm going to give you uh, a little bit of background about myself and kind of how I came uh, to do this and why. Um, so the UK, Britain, in the early 90s was a, was a pretty politicized time. Uh, and it left quite an impression on me as a, as a young person. You know, youth culture and street protest were, were very enmeshed at the time. Uh, there were groups like Reclaim the Streets. Uh, you can see a flyer here for one of their events. Um, did a kind of series of actions to try and, uh, you know, resist the, 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 the oncoming uh, climate crisis by uh, their particular methodology was to, was to block streets. To, to raise that issue. And you can see here on the top right, uh, this was really interesting. There's two people driving and staged a car crash uh, in the middle of the street and then got out and started arguing with each other and then started smashing each other's cars to pieces. It was a stunt. Um, so people didn't know what was going on and there were people hiding uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, in shops and then the subway nearby and then they ran out and threw this kind of party and destruction and blocked the streets for a long time. Um, there were also a lot of uh, road protests, um, people trying to, to, to resist, uh, you know, what they saw as, uh, you know, the actions of this, uh, of this authoritarian government that they saw at the time and people, you know, wanting to stop roads being built through, through sensitive areas and digging into tunnels and climbing into trees, building these kind of aerial structures. Um, you know, a lot of these tactics we're sort of seeing in the environmentalist movement today. I mean, this kind of particular wave of, you know, what we call, like, call creative resistance uh, you know, culminated in a, you know, a series of protests around about 1993, 1994 uh, against what was called the Criminal Justice Bill, which was to outlaw the free parties, which were at the heart of the rave scene at the time. And hundreds of thousands of young people and party goers kind of swarmed into central London uh, with sound systems and in, 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 in a series of actions of, of civil disobedience. Um, as for myself, you know, I kind of, I began my career as a writer uh, in the late 90s, working for magazines like The Face, uh, mostly writing about youth culture uh, and music. Um, strange things like driving around the M25 motorway for 25 hours on some kind of sort of psychedelic art project uh, come a uh, road trip. Um, but it wasn't really until I got to Dazed and Confused uh, that I was able to really explore my interest in this kind of crossover between style and culture uh, and social issues, you know, which is something that the magazine had had, you know, at its heart alongside its kind of core remit of fashion and culture since its beginnings in the 90s, uh, with too many stories to go into. But some of the ones, after I joined in 2005, I was keen to sort of build on that activist past. Uh, in 2006, this was a special issue that we did um, in conjunction with Amnesty, uh, all about, you know, the fight for freedom around the world. Uh, as a special cover we did with the famous political artist uh, Barbara Kruger, uh, which was fantastic that you know she wanted to work with us and created this. Um, and you know the story, the, the issue was filled with with stories from around the world, uh, including this. We got a number of uh, well-known designers to do a kind of visual interpretation of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, in 2011, we worked with the artists Jake and Dinos Chapman. Um, again, on a special cover for an issue which was all about the ongoing financial crisis and the effects that that was having on young creative people at the time, the student protests which were happening in the UK, uh, the wider Occupy movement, and which they announced their intention to pay the fines of people who'd got in trouble protesting. And you can see this kind of ransom note, can't pay your fees, uh, the student fees which students then had to pay, will pay your fines um, for the people who had ended up in court protesting against it. Uh, that same year, we also did a, a special issue all about uh, global activism. I think this was 2011 or 2012, possibly. Uh, the Chinese artist and activist Ai Weiwei, who actually, while we were in the middle of making this issue, uh, disappeared. And that was the time he was actually arrested and detained by the Chinese government uh, and went away for, for, for quite some time. So, 
you know, there's a bit of my background and my interest of, uh, you know, where this intersection of arts and culture and uh, political issues can get. Just to bring us up to the present day, as Steve mentioned, I moved to New York after I left Dazed in 2012 to work for a big makeup company. You know, I was in part attracted by Mac's uh, philanthropic side. Viva Glam campaigns raised something like 400 or 450 million dollars for the fight against uh, HIV AIDS, uh, which is, you know, fantastic. I was proud to be able to play a small role in some, in some of those campaigns. Um, but there were a couple of events uh, a couple of years ago that, um, that drew me back towards publishing, really, and wanting to kind of make a magazine to, to say something. Uh, the first of which, uh, <laughs> you know, was in 2016, uh, when the United Kingdom voted uh, very narrowly, uh, as we know, in a referendum in favor of leaving the European Union. Now, I don't have much to say about this, other than this was a really good cover the day after, I think. <laughs> um, you know, other than it came as a massive shock to, well, almost half of us. Uh, and it still does. You know, a lot of us were very sad about it and still are. So we're sorry. The other event that year that was a big shock for me, particularly as a, as a British person living in New York at that time, was in November. You know, I woke up one morning in my in my leafy liberal bubble in Brooklyn, which is one of those blue dots over on the side, uh, to find that the electoral map of America now looks like this. Um, you know, and I know other countries in Europe have also been having their issues with the rise of populist, nationalist movements, but particularly as a, as a Brit living in America, these were the two events that really you know, hit pretty hard that year. And, um, you know, the next the day after the election, I went into work, and there were literally people in floods of tears on the subway and at work. It was it was quite an intense time. Um, so you know, like many others, I was I was a bit freaked out and wondering what to do. Um, in the weeks that followed, it felt that there was like you know there were protests almost every night outside Trump Tower. Um, you know, on January the 20th, I went along to the inauguration protest in Washington, D.C., which was a particularly wild scene. I think almost 200 people uh, ended up being arrested. The next day was the Women's March uh, in Washington, uh, D.C., which was as amazing as everyone says it was. And I think, you know, you can probably get a bit of a sense of it here. And just generally, it's the energy and humor and creativity of uh, all of these protests and the actions that people were starting to take, which was, which was very inspiring to me. So I put together an early blog, as Steve mentioned, like the, literally the day, after, um, the day after the election. And in the coming weeks, it kind of evolved into this website, which was the first version of the Good Trouble website. Uh, and I wanted to do something that specifically aimed to investigate what I saw as this relationship, this intersection between arts and culture and creativity uh, with protest and in the purpose of activism to, to, to use creativity as, as a tool of social change. Uh, what is to be done? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, this was the title of uh, an interesting art show round about that time. Uh, the photograph is by Diana Lawson. Uh, the title itself, What is to be Done, actually comes from a, a revolutionary pamphlet by, by Lenin, but in a much more general sense, it was obviously a question that a lot of people um, were asking at the time, what is to be done? Our website grew, uh, other people started to get involved, uh, we started to get stories, uh, it started to take off, which was great. On the left, this is uh, part of a photo diary of the Native American uh, protest camp uh, at Standing Rock, which was trying to resist the building of uh, the Keystone XL oil pipeline uh, through it. And then, you know, we encountered interesting people doing really interesting things. Uh, this, <laughs> this is from an artist collective who used the medium of psychedelic cat gifts to explain some of the political tactics used by demagogues, and it's a bit too long to go into here, but each of these gifts uh, was illustrating essentially a different... Uh, this one is about conspiracy theories, which is one of the tactics that you know, autocrats and demo uh, demagogues use. Um, and it looks great, doesn't it? It was around about this time that we pivoted to print. Um, you know, everyone else was pivoting to video. We decided to pivot to print from digital. Um, I, I was on a panel at an event 
And uh, I'd agreed to produce a zine for people to take away. Uh, I hadn't really thought about how I was going to do that. Uh, and my friend, the art director, Richard Turley, uh, I was having a conversation with him. He's well known for his work with Bloomberg Businessweek, uh, MTV, and now at Wyden and Kennedy. Uh, the next thing we knew, uh, we'd launched a magazine. Um, specifically, this is a broadsheet newspaper. Um, this is the second issue, but it's pretty substantial in size, as you can see. Um, newsprint, we did 1,000 copies. Uh, this was released summer 2017. You can see up in here that each of them was hand numbered as well, which was a, a nice touch and more work than I actually expected it to be. <laughs> uh, this image was shot for us, which is a fantastic photograph by Matt Lambert, who's an American photographer and artist based in Berlin. Um, you know, it's kind of beautiful, defiant, and everything that we sort of wanted Good Trouble uh, as a publication uh, to be. I'll show you a closer look at the cover lines which Richard designed, just because I think they're really great. Um, sort of packed with information, a kind of masthead, and contents, uh, and various uh, little sort of quirky bits of, of, of details which we kind of included and wanted to sort of pack in and, you know, as a, as a bit of a, as a symbol of our intent. Uh, little things here, like instead of the price, we couldn't figure out what we wanted to price it at. So I was like, well, let's put pay what you want, which seemed like a nice idea, but it turned out to be incredibly complicated for anyone who wanted to stock it because that sort of broke their system immediately. And online, we couldn't find any online shop that had that as a mechanism, which feels like a miss to me because I think it's a nice thing. If you want to pay one pound for it, pay a pound. If you want to pay 10 pounds or 10 euros, whatever. Um, but yeah, it's not possible. Um, so if anyone works in the online shop thing, you should, uh, you should uh, consider adding that. Um, I'll take you through some of the spreads here. Uh, this is the opening spread. Uh, as you can see, Richard created this you know, wonderful, quite dense uh, interlocking system, which gave me pretty sort of sleepless nights trying to figure out how to fill it all. Um, I'm told that newspapers actually have staff with people to kind of work on these things. Uh, but this was, you know, the, the, there was a lot to do. Um, we took some of the existing stories from the website and kind of remixed them into print versions. We added some exclusive features like here. This is the veteran political artist, Peter Kennard, who's been making, you know, this kind of hard hitting photo collage work uh, since the late 60s. Um, it was, you know, great to get him involved in this. Uh, we added an art project. We reached out to some of our favorite artists and gave them a one-word brief, resist, uh, and you know, send, send us in something for that. Uh, Jamie Reed, um, obviously his kind of distinctive work there with Trump. Uh, other people, JR, Mark Titchener, uh, Catherine Opie, Gareth Pugh, all sent work. We went full color for the center spread. Uh, I won't show you everything, uh, but I will take you to the back spread because I think this is fun. Interesting. You can see on the left there is, you know, linking back to the kind of early late 80s and early 90s uh, enmeshing of, of rave culture and protest culture. These are archived photographs by a photographer called Matthew Smith, uh, who did a lot of work at that time and recently put a, put a book out of his work. And we were also really interested in trying to tackle serious subjects, but in slightly offbeat ways. And this page on the right, which you won't be able to read because it's in a very tiny point size. This is actually the source code for the malware that was used to hack the Democratic National Committee in the run-up to the US election. Um, so I just printed very small on that page the exact uh, computer code. Or as we put it on the cover lines, it's your own cut out and keep Russian cyber weapon. Uh, it's like a literal hacking tool, but in print form. The name, Good Trouble, uh, it comes from the veteran congressman uh, and civil rights hero, John Lewis. Uh, there's a picture of him here marching across the famous bridge in Selma in 1965 in protest against segregation. And Good Trouble is a concept that he uh, talks about quite often in commencement addresses and speeches. Uh, here's a, a recent example. When you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation, a mission, and a mandate to stand up, to speak up, and speak out and get in the way, get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. Um, yeah, so running a magazine, I mean, I'd worked in magazines before, but I had never 
had to do everything from the ground up. Uh, it turns out it is, it is quite a complicated business, isn't it? Uh, we had to find a printer. We found a fantastic old school um, print press up in Queens, New York, uh, up in the top left. Um, this is my long-suffering wife. Then we turned up in the loading bay <laughs> to actually pick up the magazines. Uh, and then putting them in envelopes to kind of to actually get them into the hands of people. I found a couple of people sitting around the house who looked like they needed something to do. <laughs> so, uh, so they helped out. Um, anyway, I'll show you this just to show you kind of literally how, how DIY and, you know, uh, you know from, from the ground up the project was. Um, so we were pleasantly surprised to start getting, um, you know, good reactions online. Um, we got some good press. People like ID Magazine started writing about us. Mag Culture wrote something very nice. Uh, what's that at top? It's nice that. Um, also, 032C, uh, Dazed, you know, all the kind of places you want to be saying nice things about you started saying nice things, which was great. Um, you know, we've gone into the shelves in some places. I think that's Kiosk Cafe in London, which is linked to Monocle magazine, I believe. The bottom left is Printed Matter in New York. Uh, and I really like this one on the right. Uh, this is the one I showed to my mum. Uh, this is art book at MoMA PS1, and you can see that we are with some really distinguished company there, like the New York Review of Books and the Atlantic and Harper's, and <laughs> yeah, talk about delusions of grandeur. Um, you know, we, we set up our online shop, uh, problems with which I mentioned. Uh, we picked up an award, the NAD Pencil for Richard's Design, which was very nice. Um, and that was kind of where this issue ran towards. We made a little bit of money, which we gave all to War Child, who are a UK charity who do a lot of work um, with children in, in war zones. Uh, and they've been doing a lot, of, a lot of good work for a long time. And some bizarre tributes started to kind of flood in from around the world, including this surfing magazine from Australia, which looked eerily familiar. <laughs> um, you know, it was all so encouraging, uh, especially, especially tributes like that. Um, that led us to do uh, issue two. Um, and this came out last summer, so summer 2018. Uh, Stack Magazines distributed this. Uh, thank you, Steve, wherever you are. Um, it uh, officially became an annual newspaper at that point, which I think is interesting. Uh, we chose four covers for this issue, uh, which we hoped would, would show some of the breadth um, and strength of some of today's resistance movements. Uh, quickly from the left is Ravi Ragbir, uh, who has been fighting his deportation uh, in New York uh, for a number of years. And he's been targeted by authorities for his involvement as an activist on the behalf of other immigrants. Uh, second from left, these are some of the resistance revival choir. There are uh, 60 strong women's choir who sing traditional protest and labor movement songs, and they've performed at the Grammys, and a number of them, like Paola Mendoza, are you know, very significant activists in their own right. <clears throat> Darian Agostini, a 23-year-old community organizer from Brooklyn. Uh, and on the far right, Jex Blackmore, who, uh, very interesting, based in Detroit. Uh, she is a performance, art performance artist uh, and a practicing Satanist. Uh, you know, who uses public rituals as a way of challenging conformity whilst also fighting for personal freedom and, and, and women's rights. The design stayed the same. Uh, you can see the same kind of cover line system. Uh, we had quotes from each of the interviews under the bottom. I've just pulled this one out to show you, and also because I think it's a nice quote. Uh, this is Ravi. The problem is that when we speak about ourselves, we are victims. When we start talking about others, we start to become leaders we start to make change. Uh, you can see that the design evolved a little bit, but retained its, you know, its same feel. It's 32 pages, so it's like a lot bigger. Uh, it was more photography. Uh, overall, it was, you know, it was, it was a headache. It was, it was like doing the difficult second album. Uh, but we, it was the second issue, so we were able to get some, some, some big names involved, people like Harry Leslie Smith, who's, who sadly died towards the end of last year but was a 95-year-old 90 author and activist who was about to go on a crowdfunded tour of the world's refugee hotspots. Uh, on the right, British uh, satirical cartoonist, 
uh, Barney Farmer, uh, who writes for the adult comic Viz, which non-Brits probably won't know. Uh, but may, you may know Hank Willis Thomas, who's a very uh, renowned contemporary artist and activist. This is a studio visit with him in Brooklyn. Uh, you can see our kind of original photography coming more onto the pages. This is by Chris Shunting. Uh, and this was the feature that the covers were taken from. Uh, this was all done in one day in a borrowed photo studio uh, with the photographer Dan Martinson. Uh, we basically just sent out a bunch of emails to everyone we could think of. Uh, and all of these individuals and groups from really amazing organizations uh, and campaigners uh, came by uh, to be photographed and to be interviewed. So this was like, you know, just, just one day in a studio. It was, really, it was an amazing experience. This is Jex, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, the, a photographer and writer went to, to spend a, a weekend with her in Detroit. Uh, and she's very interesting, very hard-hitting, provocative. Um, also very sweet, very smart. Um, but you know, her work is so challenging. She explained that it's actually easier in America for neo-Nazis to find an event space than she can. So make of that what you will. Um, this is the back spread, particularly hectic <laughs> design. I'm just kind of putting it, you know, we've got Yinka Shonabari, there's a graphic uh, novelist, Warren Ellis, philosopher, Patricia McCormack, uh, Molly Krabappel, an illustrator's project in, uh, in collaboration with a young uh, journalist from Syria about life under ISIS. You know, we really use the design to kind of just pack as many stories in as we can. And as a contrast to that, something I, I want to show you is the addition of this kind of second section that we added called the unmanifesto. Uh, the idea of this is, is like a purely visual um, counterpoint to the magazine. It comes inside it, so it's a pull-out supplement and is a, you know, a standalone issue in itself, but is all pull-out poster-sized artworks. I don't know if anyone can see that. You have to kind of deconstruct it and take it apart. Um, so, yeah, curated by Francesca Gavin, we got a number of artists, and again, we gave them a brief. We said this is like a collective visual manifesto. Uh, choose a cause that is important to you and send us a piece of work uh, in response. Um, and yeah, it's a, a pleasing contrast to all of the dense text of its, not sister publication, but of the other, the other section of the issue. This is by Boy Child. Uh, I'll just show off a couple of the other images. On the left, this is a photograph by Wolfgang Tillmans. Uh, it's of a Black Lives Matter protest in Union Square. Uh, this is a artwork by Scott King, um, a very sort of witty and quite surreal piece about him going to live as a Viking in the north of England. Uh, Sarah Rabah on the left. Helena Foster uh, on the right. We invited people to give us quotes about their artwork. Some of the artists did, some of them didn't. Um, I particularly, you know, the best way to experience this is like you actually pull the posters out and stick them on your walls. And some people sent us photos of them doing that. And uh, which I, I couldn't locate the photos, but it, looks, it, <laughs> it does look good. Um, our distribution improved. As I mentioned, Stack sent us out as a delivery. Um, this is the Whitney Museum in New York on the right, which was great. And I like this photo, which I, I found online. Uh, this is Casa magazines in the West Village, or like a really sort of old school um, magazine store. You know, like the first issue, uh, we made a bit of money. We put some of it into what we hope will be issue three. Uh, and we gave a, a, a bunch to charity. Um, in this case, RAICES, who are a Texas-based charity. That's R-A-I-C-E-S. Uh, and they've been working a lot to reunify families separated at the southern border uh, in the US by the Trump administration. What you're looking at here is actually a picture of migrant children uh, at a desert detention center uh, in Tornillo, Texas. Uh, yeah, because this is a thing that happens now. Uh, and they're a great charity who've been doing a lot of work uh, to try and get the children and the parents uh, back together. So what have we learned um, in the last two years? Uh, well, the values and the mission come first. You know, our tagline is celebrate the culture of resistance. Um, that came really early on, and it's really useful, especially you know, when you have no permanent staff, you know, no office space, uh, and you're just a loose collective kind of scattered across some continents that you, ha you know exactly what your mission is. 
Uh, and particularly, it helped us on our transition through mediums. You know, we started as a blog, um, did an event, it became a website, uh, set up the social media, and eventually it became this kind of annual newspaper. Uh, this picture on the right, we got invited to do a, a two-hour live radio show. So we did the Good Trouble uh, radio show. This is at the NTS studio in Dalston. And I show that, I think it's like, because the mission is so clear, we can apply what Good Trouble is to, to pretty much anything. Um, and we'll see where it goes from there. Um, I think, because at its heart, it's this idea of using storytelling to, to create networks. Um, uh, you know, and amplify voices around social change. And, in, in, you know, in, in, in this idea of kind of creating networks, I just wanted to introduce you to these are basically a few of the friends we made along the way uh, and hope to do more things with in the future. I mentioned Peter at the beginning. This is Peter Kennard. Uh, you know, he's been making this work since about 1968. He's particularly famous for his work with the campaign for nuclear disarmament in the 1980s. Um, and he was very supportive very early on, and even sent us this as an, in an email. Uh, good trouble is a really powerful cultural weapon that's much needed in these dark and weird times. There's nothing else like it that I know of. Uh, which was really encouraging, to be honest, and kind of, you know, I felt like, well, if, if he likes it, we must be going in the right direction. Uh, this is ML, ML Matluti. Matluti. Uh, she's a Tunisian singer-songwriter. Uh, she actually became uh, a hero of the revolution and kind of uh, uh, when one of her songs, she, uh, she was at a, a funeral for one of, one of the martyrs and she sang in the streets uh, one of her songs and it was videoed and then put up on YouTube and uh, you know, millions of hits later, she sort of had the unofficial anthem of the Arab Spring. And she lives in New York now and she just put her second album out. You know, we, we met her and told her the, her incredible story. Um, and it's, it was great to meet her, and you know, we hope to be doing more with her in the future as well. Uh, this is a fashion show. Uh, it's in a maximum security juvenile hall in California. Um, we can't show the kids' faces because they're under 18. Uh, many of them are there from, from serious uh, violent crimes. Uh, but we worked on a story. This, the fashion show was organized by a therapist called Crystal Anthony, who works with the young people, uh, and a photographer called James Mooney. Uh, you know, the US penal system's not renowned for its compassion. Uh, so this is really pioneering work. Um, so we were, you know, glad to be able to tell that story. And again, they're continuing to work on this, and, uh, you know, we're, we're still in touch with them. This is a scale model of a. Uh, civil disturbance in a, in a village in England. It's a kind of fantastical scene. It's a detail from a huge artwork, which actually is inside a 40-foot shipping container. It's made by the artist Jimmy Corty, who is known also as one half of the pop group, the KLF. Um, he's a, a visual artist, and, and, and this, this shipping container tours around the country and around the world to, to form a site of riots and is used as a, a focal point for communities um, to come together and have discussion and with the aim of community benefit. So, yeah, these are a few people that we've kind of developed relationships as we've gone along and not just wanting to tell their stories. We want to kind of become partners, uh, you know, in their mission. This is Barney, who I mentioned again, and, you know, he makes these really beautiful car cartoons about British life that can really make you laugh, make you cry. Um, and, uh, you yeah, know, I think he'll be writing, hopefully, for the, for the next issue. He's a very uh, lively presence on social media at the moment, uh, particularly around the whole Brexit debate, which I think uh, certainly in Britain is all anyone talks about uh, at the moment. Um, talking about social media, you know, as well as the people we feature, we really want to try and foster some direct relationships with our readers. Uh, this is a story that came to us. This is in Hamback, uh, and then I think this is in 2017, round about the time of the COP23 climate conference, uh, 4,000 protesters uh, stormed the coal pits and temporarily uh, shut them down. Uh, and this was you know, sent in to us by a young photographer who was there um, and thought we might be interested in it, which of course we were. Um, this was another story that came to us through Instagram. It's a photo diary of uh, a young person who spent a summer living in an anarchist camp in rural France. Now, I love that, you know, I've never met either of these people. They just came across good trouble and, you know, responded to, to its mission. Uh, and that's exactly the kind of constructive relationship that we, that we want to try and develop online. 
uh, as well as the people we feature and our readers. We're trying to form relationships with like-minded publications and some informal content partnerships. Uh, Days, 032C, ID have run versions of stories we've run, or Ekene was an original story that we, as Good Trouble, created for Days. Um, you know, it's helping grow our online audience a bit. Uh, I like to think maybe it's pushing conversations in some of these spaces into slightly different areas. Uh, you know, and it's, it's helping us grow things like our email subscriber list, which to me is really important, uh, especially as an independent publisher at the moment. Uh, because for me, it's about being able to communicate directly with readers and not have to rely on anyone else, uh, specifically social media platforms, um, you know, who don't always have our best interests at heart. Um, yeah, there's a lot of trouble online these days, and it's not always of the good kind. Let's, let's call it bad trouble. Uh, you know, it's really easy to get sucked into fighting these battles that just go on and on. And, you know, there's no real winners. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's, except there is one winner. You know, it's the social media companies themselves in whose interest it is to maintain this, you know, pointless argument. Uh, in fact, someone who said it much better than I could is someone who worked at Facebook. Uh, this former uh, VP for Facebook. He said, uh, the short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops we've created are destroying how society works. No civil discourse, no cooperation, misinformation, mistruth. Um, which is quite something coming from someone who really worked at it. Okay. Um, so, you know, it brings me to, you know, what... To, you know, someone I think saw this moment coming more than most is J.G. Ballard, uh, you know, his 2006 book, Kingdom Come. You know, they knew they were being lied to, but if lies were consistent enough, they defined themselves as a credible alternative to the truth. Emotion ruled almost everything, and lies were driven by emotions that were familiar and supportive, while the truth came with hard edges that cut and bruised. You know, it's true. The truth is scary at the moment. Um, and it does cut and bruise. There aren't two sides to everything. Uh, putting kids in cages in the desert, uh, erasing transgender rights, threatening the media, being a white supremacist. These are all things that are bad. Um, you know, and I think in these times, we have a responsibility to say so. You know, this brings me back uh, to the end. You know, this question, what is to be done? Well, in response to that, you know, I'd like to ask, what will it take? You know, today is March the 15th. Uh, you may or may not be aware, but around the world, uh, you know, children are walking out of school today, staging a series of strikes in protest against the lack of climate, uh, a lack of action against the climate crisis. This picture is actually from Sydney, Australia this morning. Uh, I went online and found it. Um, you know, and I think the latest update was there's 2,052 uh, places in 123 countries on all continents, including Antarctica. Um, and I'm not sure how the Antarctica one works, but I'm kind of interested to find, to find that out. This is Greta Thunberg. Uh, she started this movement last year when she walked out of school at the age of 15 uh, to, 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 to go on strike. And that simple action has grown into this movement. In, in a recent interview, she said, we've come here to let you know change is coming, whether you like it or not. The real power belongs to the people. So, you know, what next? Steve mentioned issue three. You know, we've recently started work on it. Um, we hope it'll be out later this summer. Uh, it's too early to say much about it, uh, although we hope the, I think the previous few slides will probably give you an idea of what we want to focus on. Uh, 2019, uh, we think, hope, uh, will be a pivotal year in the fight against climate change. Uh, you know, between now and then, we're going to be doing what we can. We'll be updating, uh, adding stories, posting to our feeds uh, as much as we can. So in conclusion, you know, I don't want to make any particular claims for Good Trouble, which at the end of the day is just a small independent publication. Uh, we're trying to shine a light on a few amazing people who are using art and creativity uh, as a tool of social change. But in these difficult times, uh, what I really hope is that all of us, you know, whoever we are, whatever we're involved with, uh, that we can all find a way to make some good trouble, necessary trouble. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. <laughs>